at any rate, a technology that we do not properly understand today. This is the Altiplano in Bolivia, in the High Andes. And I'm showing this photograph really to indicate how sparsely populated the Altiplano is, how few people live there at an altitude of more than 12,000 feet above sea level. It's not the kind of terrain that can support a large population. Crops are grown, but they come out of the ground stunted, and the yield is extremely low. As a result, very few people live on the Altiplano today. And there's a mystery in that, and a problem in that, and it's to do with the city of Tiwanaku, which stands on the Altiplano at an altitude of 12,500 feet above sea level. Here's a bit of Tiwanaku. This is the piece of Tiwanaku that's called the Puma, Puma Punku. And it consists of absolutely enormous blocks of stone. I mean, they're just unimaginably large. This piece has been calculated to weigh 400 tons. And I can't understand, I just don't see it within orthodox historical explanation, how at this altitude above sea level, 12,500 feet, where you cannot grow crops to support a large population who could haul those stones into place. And I don't know if 400 ton blocks could be hauled into place by anybody. How this could have been done at that altitude and in that location and why it was done. I think that the city of Tiwanaku is one of the most mysterious sites in the world. In a way, it's the new world equivalent of Giza. It's a site about which there are far more questions than answers and a site about which uh, the dating uh, needs to be seriously re-examined. The dating of Tiwanaku by Orthodox archaeologists has for a long time been set at around 500 AD, just about 1500 years ago. Although more recently, there are some archaeologists working in the area who have daringly sought to push that date back. And there are a few who've stuck their neck out and said that Tiwanaku may go back as far as 2000 BC. The difference of opinion amongst the scholars uh, in itself uh, shows how little we know about this site. The conventional view that dates it to 500 AD is based on the classical study by Professor Max Yule, who's always cited as the great authority on Tiwanaku. I was surprised to discover that his influential book on Tiwanaku had been written without him ever having found the need to actually visit the site himself. Another scholar also worked on the site, Professor Arthur Poznanski from La Paz University, and he not only visited Tiwanaku, he lived there. He lived there for the best part of 50 years, and he took very careful measurements of every aspect of the site. And he studied, in particular, the astronomical alignments of the site. We're looking at one of the Tiwanaku structures, the Kalasa Sia here, uh, photographed in the afternoon with the sun setting towards the west. There's another astronomical phenomenon that can be used for dating monuments, and it's called the obliquity of the ecliptic. The Earth has a tilt. The axis of the Earth is tilted. And this tilt, although not many of us know it, changes very slowly like that. It nods in space in a slow cycle of about 41,000 years. And the effect of the changing obliquity is to cause the sunrise, the position of sunrise at either of the solstices, uh, the longest and shortest days of the year, to change very slowly along the horizon. And if you can establish that uh, certain structures were aligned to a solstitial rising of the sun by a people who normally were extremely accurate in what they did, and if that alignment is out, it's suggestive of an older date for the site. Poznanski, to howls of derision from his fellow scholars, pointed out that the solstitial alignments of certain uh, monuments in Tiwanaku were out. And when he calculated the time when those alignments would have been perfectly exact, he came to around 12,000 years ago. And he suggested daringly that Tiwanaku might be the oldest city in the world, that it might originally have been laid out and aligned to the solstitial risings of the sun 12,000 or more years ago. Of course, his view is not accepted. It's universally ridiculed by our scholars. And yet there are aspects of the Tiwanaku site which strongly support the notion that it's extremely ancient. 
One of them is this monument, known as the Gateway of the Sun. All these names that are given to structures at Tiwanaku are entirely arbitrary because we know nothing about the people who built Tiwanaku. When the Spanish first arrived in the Andes, they asked the Incas, did you build these monuments? And the Incas laughed. They said, no way. We didn't build these monuments. These monuments were built thousands of years ago by the gods. Well, such ideas are considered to be whimsy by our scholars, and yet they may not be whimsy. Let's have a look on the reverse of the gateway of the sun. And what I want to draw attention to here is this feature, this frieze that is carved on the reverse of the gateway of the sun, and this particular aspect of it here. I don't think I'm hallucinating. I think that I'm looking at two large ears, two eyes, a trunk, and two tusks. In other words, I think that I'm looking at the face of some sort of elephant. If I am looking at the face of some sort of elephant, then there's a real problem with the dating of this site, because there have not been any elephant-like creatures in the New World for a very long time. In fact, you have to go back to around 10,000 BC, around 12,000 years ago, to find a creature that fits that bill. And that creature, here's a biological reconstruction drawing of it, was called Cuvieronius. It was one of those great Ice Age mammals that became extinct suddenly and dramatically at the end of the last Ice Age. Could we be looking at a drawing, a carving of, of Cuvieronius done from life long before history began? And here, another ancient piece of stone from Tiwanaku. Very faded, very worn down, but let's trace out this figure that appears on it. There's the two hind legs, the two front legs, the open mouth, the uplifted snout, the ears, the curved back, and the tail of an apparently unidentifiable species of mammal. It doesn't look anything like any animal that runs around in the Andes today. But it does look very like an extinct mammal, and that mammal was called Toxodon. There's a, a biological reconstruction drawing of Toxodon. And uh, Toxodon, like Cuvieronius, became extinct at around 12,000 years ago. And prior to that, had been found plentifully in the area of Tiwanaku. With these kind of carvings and the astronomical dating done by Poznansky, I think there's a prima facie case for a complete re-examination of what Tiwanaku might really be and how old it might be and what it might mean. And uh, there is other evidence that points in that direction as well. We're looking at Lake Titicaca here and at one of those reed boats. And Lake Titicaca today is uh, 12 miles away and 100 feet lower than Tiwanaku. And yet, even orthodox archaeologists agree that Tiwanaku was built originally as a port on the shores of Lake Titicaca. There's massive harbor constructions. Uh, to be found at Tiwanaku, and there's really no doubt that it was built as a port. So the question is, how long does it take a lake like Lake Titicaca to recede in depth by 100 feet and 12 miles away from the edge of the city of Tiwanaku? I discussed this problem with uh, geologists from the British Geological Survey working in that area. Oddly enough, they didn't know about Tiwanaku but uh, they did know about Lake Titicaca. And they told me that that amount of recession of that particular lake would have taken at least 10,000 years. So another science, geology, is pointing to a far greater antiquity for the city of Tiwanaku than is accepted by our scholars today. Finally, from Tiwanaku, I want to draw attention to this figure. It's assumed to be, and it probably is, an image of that legendary god, Viracocha, who came with his demigods, the Viracochas, to South America long, long ago, who's remembered in all those myths. Again, it's a very worn piece of stone, but the goatee beard of this figure, this rather extravagant goatee beard, is quite easy to make out. That's how Viracocha is described in all the legends, a tall, pale-skinned, bearded figure. And his description does not fit in any way the description of the indigenous inhabitants of that region. Indeed, the description of these Viracochas and the memory of them 
was so strongly held in South America that when the Spanish under Pizarro arrived to loot and rape and destroy the culture of South America, to wipe clean the memory banks of mankind in South America, to our loss, I may add, they were not initially opposed. It was assumed that they were the Viracochas returning. And because the Viracochas had been remembered as good people, bringers of civilization, it was mistakenly assumed that these European pirates were also good people. Well, we know now that they were not, 